Thank you. We're going to go through the eligibility, we're going to go through the application form and the budget and all the requirements there. There will be time for questions at the end uh, for those that are watching live at the moment. You can type your questions in as we go, but please note we won't come to them until the end. And uh, also you can raise your hand and we can take questions from the room. Uh, I'll be talking about some other webinars that we've got coming up as well. Um, but first, as a little introduction, I'm going to introduce uh, Sean Kelly from the Arts Council. He is the Senior Manager of Music at Arts Council England, and uh, he's going to tell us a bit more about the fund and where this fits into the um, you know, wider support of grassroots music from Arts Council England. Sean. Hi, everybody. Yeah, as Ben says, I, I'm Sean Kelly and I look after the or work closely on the Support and Grassroots Music Fund at Arts Council England. Um, so I think firstly, I just wanted to say that we've, we've been working on this for a while and we're really genuinely excited about getting to the stage where applications are, are going to start coming in or are already coming in. Uh, we think independent promoters are absolutely critical to the grassroots music sector, both in supporting venues and festivals to program sort of a diverse range of acts and just really support getting new audiences through the doors. So the, the background of this funding is that it comes from the creative industries team at DCMS uh, via Arts Council, and it's closely linked to the support and grassroots music program that we deliver at the Arts Council that some of you might be aware of and which is also funded from the creative industries team at DCMS. So we've delivered that program in various forms since about 2019. And promoters have always been eligible for that fund and always have been supported through that fund. However, when we published an evaluation of the program uh, in March last year, that evaluation did identify that some independent promoters found our application processes quite time consuming. Uh, particularly for the level of funding that they were applying for. So if they were early career, if they were at the start of the journey and maybe hadn't made, made applications for public funding before, the Arts Council project grants process was a little bit onerous. So the Early Career Promoters Fund is really our way of uh, bridging that gap. And we're really grateful to PRSF and Ben and colleagues for, for leading on it. So the other thing I'd like to say before passing back to Ben and everybody is that support and grassroots music is very much still open uh, and it's very much still open to promoters. So if today or in the coming weeks you realize that what you want to do isn't quite right for this fund, there's every chance that you might be eligible for support and grassroots music. So do come and have a chat with us about applying. Unfortunately, I can't prom promise that the, that the processes are any less onerous than what they were. But we, what we do have is a team of uh, five, uh, support and grassroots relationship managers whose sort of whole purpose is to support applicants that are and particularly first-time applicants and making applications to that fund and um, other than that good luck with your applications and um, sure there's going to be some really fantastic work through the fund and i'll pass you back to ben and colleagues at prsf to talk you through things thanks sean that's great um Great, so we're going to kick straight into a little presentation of uh, what the fund is, what PRS Foundation is, and what we're all about. Um, just get that going. My Zoom bar is blocking my ability to screen share that one second. Okay. And you see my screen not visible great okay so um this is the, the uh, presentation of the early career promoter fund today and how to apply um a little bit of background first about prs foundation for those that don't know um we are the uh the leading charitable funder of new music and talent development, supporting music creative development through direct grants and through the organisations and individuals, of course, that we fund. We invest in the future of new music and stimulating sector development from the grassroots up. We are creative focus covering all genres UK wide. 
since 2000, we've supported over eight and a half thousand new music projects, and we enable music creators of all backgrounds to realize their potential, create exceptional new music and reach audiences across the world. And of course, this fund is aimed at promoters, which feeds into the ecosystem of creators, um, which is why we're really happy to be taking on this work. I won't go through all this, but there, there are many programs that the PRS Foundation presents, and you can see them all on our website. Uh, they they're for all career levels. There's international showcase funds, there is funds for organisations, and there's funds for individuals, which is what we're talking about today with the Early Career Promoter Fund. So what is it? I'm sure you've done a little bit of research if you're here already, but uh, the Early Career Promoter Fund is uh, grants of up to three and a half thousand pounds for a range of new activity, which includes the booking, programming and promotion of gigs, concerts, club nights, showcases and other performances. You can include in that cost associated with those activities, including all the usual things, venue hire, production, artist, DJ fees, crew fees, admin, administration and other related costs. You can include things for capacity building or, or personal development, which could include mentoring, shadowing, workshops, masterclasses, and other skill building and networking opportunities. Another expenditure which helps grantees to program a diverse range of artists and develop new audiences. So alongside the grant support, we are also going to be playing, supplying some wraparound support. This is all about uh, improving uh, early career promoters networks and skills so as well as the funding to perform the the shows themselves there's additional support with uh, from prs foundation we're going to manage a program of wraparound support including toolkits for early year promoters that will include the pooling of existing industry resources from different trade bodies and the creation of new toolkits which are based on focus group conversations of industry and sector needs We'll present a series of industry masterclasses covering topics such as deal types, budgeting, licensing, health and safety, and inclusive practice. And these will be available to grantees around every three to four months. We'll also be onboarding each grantee. So as there's nine rolling deadlines, we'll have nine cohorts um, of, of grantees. Um, we will have uh, an onboarding call for each cohort, which you'll be encouraged to make. And you could make connections with other promoters and other people doing similar things to you. Um, and as I say, masterclasses will be held quarterly for all grantees. So, that, so the funding priorities of the Early Career Promoters Fund, and there are, there are a few more than this that are detailed in the application form. So I would, I would advise you to look at it in more depth, of course, but in this presentation, I'm just picking out um, some of the main things to consider. It is to help emerging promoters do what they do best, to book and develop scenes, support artists and DJs, and to reach and engage audiences locally, regionally and nationally. To help promoters to build towards sustainable careers in the grassroots music center, sector, and to bolster the local, regional and national pipeline. Um, to support music events in all genres across England, which PRS Foundation is very proud to do and to help promoters to deliver events and work at a scale beyond their current experience levels. I think this is a really important one. Um, you know, many of you are promoting events already. This fund is to see how we can help you get to the next level of your career, whatever that may be. Um, so yes, we've had a few sort of general inquiries that have, have focused more on, I'm doing this, but I'm losing money. Can you just help help me to, to break even with this grant? The idea is that we would we'd give you um, the stepping stones to to capacity build and and step up to the next level. Um, so it's definitely worth considering. So who can apply? We're intentionally leaving this as open as we possibly can in terms of um, getting applications in to see who is in need of most funding or of funding the most. Um, so uh, Eligible applicants must be based in England, as this, this is DCMS and Arts Council England funded, and they must be an early career independent music promoter. Now, we allow promoters to self-identify as early career, but with the following recommendations. So we are highly unlikely to support those who are completely new to booking and promoting shows. We expect that applicants will have promoted at least two events. 
Likewise, we're unlikely to support those deemed as established promoters regionally and nationally who should instead be applying for Arts Council England's supporting grassroots music fund. Most eligible applicants will be working part-time promoters or supplementing income elsewhere. So there is an, application, uh, an opportunity on the application form to state if you don't think you fall specifically into those categories, but you feel like you partly do and you want to give an explanation as to why you need further support, then you are able to do that and you won't be deemed as ineligible. But we'll come on to that as well when we have a look at the application form. More of who can apply. The funding can be for anyone over 18 years old. There's no upper age limit, so we're not classing early years promoters as young promoters, just uh, early years in terms of their career marker. Uh, anyone who is under 18 years old, we'd recommend you go to Youth Music, who have a number of um, excellent initiatives. There's Likely eligible grantees will be operating on a small scale in terms of the capacity and events they've been promoting so far. Most eligible applicants will be considered as out-of-house promoters rather than in-house promoters or bookers. And again, we can come on to a bit more on that later. We'll consider applications from artists promoting events which develop their own promoter brands and the development of scenes, but not their development as an artist. This is an appreciation that some genres um, are very much led by, by artists as promoters. So um, there is scope for applications from artists. As I said, there's not many reasons why you wouldn't be able to apply, but uh, these are some of the key ones. Events and tours happening outside England. Capital purchases, including AV equipment and building work. Projects requesting funding that will or would be covered without the need for funding. Activities taking place before funding decisions are communicated. Decisions will take up to eight weeks for each round. So consider which round you want to come into. As I'll come on to later, there are nine deadlines for this fund. Um, so consider applying for one that will fit the time scale. And bear in mind as well that it can take two to four weeks for payment to reach your account after the approval stage. Um, so if you're reliant on that cash flow, please obviously allow 10 to 12 weeks, I would say. Um, attendance at conferences and events taking place outside the UK cannot be funded. Promotion of events taking place outside England and applicants who have concurrent funding from the Arts Council supporting grassroots music programme, as Sean suggested, um, is for promoters who are already at that level. So the application process. Fairly straightforward. If you've applied for PRS funding before, you will have an account on the PRS Foundation Flexi Grant site. If not, you can create an account very easily by going to the fund application page, which I'm sure most of you have to find the sign up for this. Um, so check your project meets the eligibility criteria, which we've either gone over, but look, but look at the, the, the further criteria on there. I've covered the main points, but um, which should give you a good indication, but the, there is more information on the website. As I say, check up the deadlines and set up your account if you don't already have one. During the application process, each application is open for four weeks before this deadline and it rolls into the next deadline. Applications are assessed by industry expert industry advisors. So you'll be assessed by a couple of advisors in a genre, uh, you know, by an expert who understands the genre that you're, you are working in. Shortlisted applicants are then discussed at decision panels. And then decisions can take up to eight weeks after the deadline, but you will um, get them shortly after the decision panels. If you're successful, congratulations. Just make sure you read your offer letter careful and follow the necessary steps to get that first payment, which will be 80% of the grant support up front. You'll get 20% upon receipt of a satisfactory project report. So you're getting the vast majority uh, in advance. And as we say here, if you're unsuccessful, don't be discouraged. It's going to be very competitive. We can see there's a lot of applications drafting. We know from our other funds that there's, um, you know, they are uh, oversubscribed. There is a lot of applications that come into these funds. Uh, we do allow you to apply up to three times to the Early Career Promoter Fund. We will try and give you advice in that, in any rejection that will tell you whether to come back in for that. Um, obviously we say, please try and wait three months before reapplying. 
um, just to make sure you get the application right. But if your deadline, if your event is happening at a set date and time, then of course you might need to get it in sooner and you can just email us and I'm sure that we can, um, you know, we can make arrangements so that um, you, you can get that second application in a little sooner. I'm just going to stop screen sharing on that for now. Uh, second. Screen stops. Here we go. And I'm going to show you the application form. So we'll go through that as well. Still finding my way around. Here we go. You can see the application form there. Great. So the application form consists of six parts, as you can see here. We've been through the eligibility, and I've done a kind of mock application here just to show you. So you'll be aware of most of the uh, eligibility. We can, we call this a, a quiz. Uh, you will be told if you, you're getting the quiz wrong, and you'll be able to uh, change the answers if they are incorrect. But it does give, give you an idea of if you are eligible. So it goes through the basic points, making sure you've read the guidance, making sure you're based in England, uh, making sure the activity you're proposing is uh, within England and also within the time frame of the decisions. Because obviously, as we say, don't put in an application today for an event you want to run in June. Obviously, that will be too soon to get your answer. As I mentioned earlier, you have the opportunity to say if you partly qualify for the Early Career Promoter Fund. If you completely qualify, of course, select yes. Uh, if you partly qualify, it does open a box that gives you an opportunity to, to explain why you feel that you would benefit from the support, even though you probably don't fit the expected eligibility. So as, as you can see, as an example there, I've just copy and pasted one of these reasons, such as I've been promoting for over 15 years and I've recently moved to promoting house nights at a club. So I consider myself to be early career promoter in the club scene. That's the, the example of a reason why you might feel you partly um, uh, fit the bill. You ask how many events you've promoted so far at the time of applying. We'd expect this to be, uh, you know, more than a couple. Um, there's no upper limit as such. Um, we allow you to self-identify, as I say, as early career promoters. Um, you also asked how long you've been promoting music events for if I happen to select uh, that I uh, do not match the eligibility, you'll see you get a little pop-up saying you're not eligible um, and explains why. Um, so assuming you've done the quiz correctly, you'll be allowed to continue to the next page. So this is about you and you will already have, if you've got an account, your um Personal information will be already in the system, so you won't need to re-enter that. Um, ooh, excuse me. And uh, these questions are pretty self-explanatory. Don't need to go over all of these, but it's a uh, little bit of information about where you are. You're asked to provide a website or social media. Don't worry if you don't have a website. By all means, put your social media or whatever you use to promote your um, your events. You do have the option to submit either written or video or not audio applications. It's whatever works for you. The video and audio options um, are uh, great for people with uh, certain access needs and allow, um, you know, a, a, a potentially easier application process. You may feel that writing it down and being able to refresh it suits you. You are not scored any differently based on how you decide to, to submit the application. Um, but for this example, we're going to stick with written application. If you did select video or audio application, you would find uh, that boxes appear that allow, allow you to upload your information rather than write it. And then this, this bit covers uh, bits about your track record. There's plenty of guidance here and exactly what you should include there. <clears throat> Why now is the right time for you to receive support? Uh, pretty self-explanatory tells the, the career level you, that you're at and where you want to get to and how this fund can help you get there. You're asked to submit your earnings from music in the last 12 months and how much of that has come from promotion activities. I've completely put these numbers in to populate. 
uh, they're not expected figures or anything like that. Um, and yeah, all self-explanatory on that page just about. So your proposed activities is obviously where <clears throat> the main chunk of your application is going to be assessed. So uh, if you are, we'll just go down it. So you're allowed to tick as many of these that seem appropriate. So on this event, on this mock application, I've imagined I'm doing multiple events that are in grassroots music venues and multiple different venues. Um, but please tick all that apply. Uh, you're asked for the appropriate main genre from the drop down menu. And this is obviously to make sure that we get your application into an advisor who knows about your genre and understands the music and the grassroots music scene. Um, so please consider that when selecting. You'll be a, there's a secondary field as well. Um, and yeah, we'll just make sure that gets to the to the right people so it's assessed fairly. You're then given the opportunity to give a very concise um, application uh, headline, followed by a more uh, detailed plan with, again, very detailed bullet points on what, what you should include. In this instance, I've just said that I'm promoting a series of club nights showcasing grassroots local DJs from underrepresented communities. Um, again, that is, that is form populating. Uh, your event will be what it will be, but there's there's a, an example. And I've used the example of doing shows using underrepresented communities so that I can got the opportunity to show you how to apply for further funds um, for access later on in the application, but it's obviously not a requirement as such. How will you work to book support DJs, performers and creators involved? So this is your chance to tell us how you generally work with talent, your attitude towards talent development and how you approach fair pay. There are links to um, uh, details on fair pay from Arts Council England on our guidance. I would recommend that you read through those to understand fair pay. Uh, and that, of course, can include fair pay for yourself as well. Um, so please have a good read of that. And uh, yeah, we want to obviously make sure that we're funding things that uh, mean people, artists, crew uh, and promoters are paid fairly. There's a chance to tell us about the marketing and promoting of the relevant activities. Of course, that will be further detailed in the budget section of this. But um, yeah, please tell us how you would plan to market this show. Um, we do expect that the marketing will cost no more than 20% of your overall budget uh, or your of your ticket sales income. Um, so do bear that in mind. Um, these are the the fine prints of the of the guidance so again just make sure you do read the guidance in full as well as attend these sessions i think you will find lots of extra pieces of information uh, how you'll manage the project and how you respond to challenges you might encounter so obviously thinking about the uh you know the potential challenges that might come up from doing the show that you might that you're planning to do what the potential risk to that show is and how you would counteract them and then there's a chance to talk about your approach to sustainability, diversity, equity and inclusion. While we don't expect every event, of course, to be centred around sustainability and DEI, we would expect that there's a general grasp of uh, the importance of these things. And um, you have, you know, the shared values of PRS Foundation. We want we want to support things that are mindful, of course, of sustainability um, and DEI. So please. Oops have a think about that and then a timeline so I've made a mock timeline here which uh which is as if I was doing the the description that I gave which is that I'm <clears throat> going to put on four shows in the southwest uh in local clubs with uh DJs from under underrepresented areas so with the activity timeline here you get six there's only six boxes so think carefully about what you want to put in you might be promoting more than six events, for example, um, you know, although we don't expect you to necessarily go that that high. Um, so you might not need to put all the events in, but you can, you can, you know, you can group the events together should it be necessary. And in this instance, I've just um, I've just gone into the booking phase, the marketing and then the four events. But it might be that you want to put in the on sale or other key events um, that, um, that 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 are happening as part of your activities. So you got the chance to put the start date and end dates in there and then a concise description of exactly what you will be doing. 
and then the opportunity to put if that's if that activity is confirmed or provisional uh so like i say in this case i've just put in the booking the marketing and then the four events um apologies i can't prevent those software changes <laughs> um okay on to the next page So four of six, we've got the funding priorities. These are really important to understand. And we did go through some of them in the deck, but it's important to understand and link back to all these when you're answering this part of the uh, application form. So how does it meet the aims of that? So yeah, thinking very much, how how is it helping you in terms of your career take that, that step forward? How is it helping the ecosystem of grassroots music scene? We want, we want projects that, um, you know, boosts the grassroots grassroots grass music ecosystem as much as possible. So as many stakeholders as possible are benefiting, such as artists, venues, and obviously promoters, crews, uh, and that in general, obviously the nighttime economy is is benefiting from this. So really think about how many of these you are uh, hitting. And try and be concise, concise as possible as eat on each. Don't sort of get lost in going into one point without covering the others. Obviously, you are limited by a 500 word count. And then what are your other development needs? Um, have you factored into the request for support? So as we say, this is all about um, additional support for yourselves, as well as the wraparound support that we will offer. We would expect you to put in uh, funding to um, take you to a conference or to give you a mentor or lots of other examples. Um, so we want to know um, what kind of uh, support you are factoring in to your request. Um, you can be very honest here about your skills and knowledge gaps. This is an early career promoter fund. We're not expecting everybody to know everything. This will help to inform us on what skill gaps need to be filled with both the wraparound support and the masterclasses. Um, so please feel free to be um, honest here and and tell us exactly the kind of support um, that you would need and the kind of support that you are putting into your application as well. OK, so we come on to the budget. So. In this instance. I'm going to make the budget for this. Uh, these four shows that I'm putting on in the southwest. My total project budget is 4725. Now you don't necessarily have to answer that question first because you will do your budget down below here and you'll find the figure for the, for how much money you are um, trying to, uh, how much money you expect the whole project to cost, which you can then populate above. Just make sure that the figures match. I have put the total request amount from PRS Foundation at 2250. I've done that as a pure example of the average amount we expect each grant, sorry, not each grant, but the average amount we expect um, the, the grants to be. Of course, they can range from £750 to 3500 but purely as an average example uh, hit for this application, I am asking for 2250 I have not put that there are any other private sources. We think this is going to be very unlikely that you're going to have funding from anywhere else. So please don't uh, think that we expect you to have funding elsewhere. If you do, then great. Tell us about it. Um, but it is not an expectation by any means. An example, uh, sorry, a chance here to tell us why you need the funding support. So again, how this is going to help your event to, to break even and to help you step up to a, another level and to help build your network and uh, to help build your career. And then for the budget chart here, um, there are <clears throat> lots of different uh, lines that you can fill in. You do not have to fill in every single one. This application is quite basic and I've just done in terms of artists, I've said that um, for ease, I'm just saying that there's four headliners that are all getting the same fee and it's £400. Um, so the total amount there is 1600 You have the chance to say if the funding from the ECPF will support this uh, and you can select yes or no. You can see further down where I've got production costs here. I've put that the production is included in the higher. Obviously, that's not always the case, but in this example, it is. And I've selected the uh, no here. So um, marketing, 
as I say, try and make sure that it's um, no more than 20% of the um, expected ticket sales. So in this case, uh, I'm saying that marketing would be £500. And I'm adding as much detail as I can into the details here. We like details. You know, it shows us that you've thought through and that you've got the actual costs. Um, you know, all costs aren't usually round numbers. If you've done your research, they're usually... Um, different figures so to, 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 it's a good chance for you for you to tell us that you know you, you've you've done your research and you know what things are going to cost uh, by putting as much detail in here so again for this example I'm keeping it straightforward and I'm saying that additional staffing is covered within the venue and that PRS for music costs are covered in the venue obviously um, PRS for music is traditionally 4.2 percent of um, of ticket sales um, we will be covering more, you know, we, we're talking about early career promoters here. So, you know, we expect that uh, that will be part of the masterclass and wraparound support that will be based around PRS for Music um, support. Um, PRS for Music and insurance here, they are not eligibility questions. They're purely asking if they are part of your budget. You will not be uh, you will not be made ineligible if you are not putting these costs in. But here are some examples. Insurance costs, I've just put in some rough figures. It might be that you hold policies that cover you for the whole year and you are saying that these two, you know, this, these are proportions of the cost that would cover those those um, those events. And I put here that, uh, that this fund would not be covering that. And there's a little uh, extra thing. Uh, there's a chance to put audience access costs in. I've put here that we're going to create a calm space for neurodivergent audience members with fidget toys and um, accessible lighting and and, and things. Uh, I've put £200 in for that. This is purely an example. You're not um, obliged to uh, uh, have audience access costs. Although, however, obviously, we, um, we advise everybody to make sure their events are ac as accessible as possible. We've talked about there being additional access top-ups for audience, sorry, for artists and for yourselves. If you have access needs yourself, that can go on top of the grant uh, ask, but we do expect that any audience access costs would be within the grant itself, which is why this is linked here. So this is not the place to add any um, access costs for your artists or for yourself. So that shows that the uh, the costs so far are 4,375. And then there's a chance to put other capacity building exercises into your budget here. So we do expect that you would um, you would take yourself to one industry conference to uh, uh, build your network, et cetera. So I put in the classic Great Escape there, 150 pounds. Uh, it, there will be other uh, conferences that are much more uh, suitable for your, your genre and your world. So uh, whatever you feel is necessary. Again, it's not an eligibility factor, but we, we do it. You know, we do want to support those who are asking for support for themselves as well. So it does help your application if you are considering these things. And then also we're going to have some mentorship from Dave Bloggs, A1 Promotions who charges £50 for four sessions, um, so the cost of that is £200. Um, there's chances to add other items, promoter brand development, um, and any membership fees for um, music trade bodies as well. So you can see that the total is £350, so added together with my show cost, that is £4725 as my overall expenditure, which is what I was saying earlier about making sure this figure at the top uh, matches um, here, so 4725. And the ask is for 2250, which I'll show you makes the balance budget. So the overall expenditure is 4725. When we come onto the income, I've made an estimate that we're going to sell 495 tickets at five pounds, which equals 2475 pounds. I've done that on an estimate of 70% of capacity. The, the idea of the early career promoter fund is that the grant helps you to, to reach the break-even point. So we we ask you not to, or we recommend that you don't, you know, make your break-even point sell out, make it as modest as and, and realistic as you can. So we recommend 70 to 80%. Um, if you happen to make a profit, 
then we would discuss with you what we what you should do with that money and the options maybe to pay yourselves fairly to make sure that the other stakeholders are paid fairly like the artists um, and uh, and anyone else or you may choose to reinvest the money in future grassroots music events which we would of course support very much so we've got uh we've got 2475 pounds in ticket sales and the grant amount is for 2250 and the event breaks even you'll see here the expenditure and income should be zero and here it is it's zero if your figure is not zero you will need to rejig the figures so that it is breaking even and you won't be able to submit your application until that is the case you're asked about the uh the uh in-kind contributions and expenditures relating to the application um, I have put here as an example that there's £750 of in-kind support because I spoke to my venues and they all wanted to support good cause of our activities with reduced rates. Um, so full cost of venues uh, would have been £2,700, um, but we got a discount on that. It's purely an example. This this fund is to you know give life to the grassroots music ecosystem so we don't necessarily want you to be asking venues for reductions but purely an example maybe there's a, you know your uh, production company bringing the pa in for whatever are giving you discount um or, or anything like that it's just good to let us know what the in-kind support is and then we've touched on the access related top-up funding so this is for um those with access needs who may be yourselves they may be the artists um, or crew members or anybody that you are working with. Um, so there's some examples of exactly what that might be here and uh, also includes promoters or artists who incur additional childcare or child giving, giving costs to take part <clears throat> Excuse me, in the funded events. Uh, funding decisions will not be affected by additional accessibility support requests and if selected uh, an appropriate offer amount will be pledged this is not seen by the advisors or the panelists that make the decisions this is purely uh, you for you to let us know what you might need so you're asked if this is relevant to you and in this point i've said yes it is because i'm booking artists from underrepresented backgrounds i anticipate the need for access budgets to make accommodations for accessible dressing rooms um, and other things and i've requested amount of uh, i think 500 pounds as a mock example there of course, that's, you're not obliged to to um, ask for additional access money, but that is the uh, an example of if you were um, in an ideal world, you would have you know confirmed activities and uh, a firm idea of who your artists are. So you'd say, I, you know, I do need access access costs. Um, yeah. So that is the budget form. We're getting towards questions. I'm sure. There are a few, I think, after that, we're just talking monitoring, are we? Yeah, so I won't go over the monitoring. It's very straightforward. You will know the answers to these questions. Uh, once everything is filled in, you will have the opportunity then um, to return to the summary page. <clears throat> and providing everything is in order, you can submit your application and that will go through. Um, so that is the application form i'm just going to return very quickly to the presentation to round off there before questions so you've seen the application form you've seen the eligibility the top tips are to really make sure you've read the eligibility to understand the relevance of your activities as i say make sure they are in line with the purposes of the fund how does it help the grassroots ecosystem how does it help you to build your career to the next level plus the many other funding priorities that we've been through make it clear can the person assessing your application understand your project plan and how the activity will develop you bear in mind this person is reading that application for the first time make sure it is very easy to understand Cost accordingly, are you being sensible and showing detail, research costs, and make sure you're paying yourself and collaborators fairly. And as I say, there are resources to make sure you are um, you are uh, paying fairly, like I say, on our guidance and through the Arts Council. 
additional support, as we say, could be mentoring, coaching, shadowing and partnering with festivals, attending workshops, masterclasses and conferences, training, including DEI training and support related to sustainability, accessing legal advice and accounting services, bespoke support identified as important to the applicant. So you've got the opportunity to tell us what feels right for you to build your career. And we do have an another webinar on May the 30th where you can learn more about building your network and contacts. Uh, we have uh, a great promoter joining us for a QA and a and to talk more about capacity building and career and network development. These are the deadlines. The first one's coming up, June 13th. There are nine deadlines. Think carefully about which one is most applicable to you uh, in terms of when your activity is. Bear in mind that round one is going to be quite popular. It is, uh, we're seeing a lot of excitement and interest in this. <clears throat> it could be a busy round. If, you're up, if your funding is not until next year, for example, early next year, then consider whether you need to wait. But obviously, the earlier you go, I guess, the more opportunities you would have if um, you were unsuccessful. But look, consider everything carefully. There are nine deadlines spoke for long enough and I've got a frog in my throat. So we're going to open up the floor for some questions. Um, I'll stop sharing momentarily. Um, if there's any on the floor and anyone wants to raise a hand and unmute themselves, then we could start with anything on the floor if there is anything. No one wants to raise a hand. Is there a raise hand function? Uh, I see a few people manually doing it. Uh, Andrew, Andrew, you've got your you've got your hand up there. Do you want to go ahead, Andrew Houghton? I think you're muted. Oh, doesn't say he's muted. Can we unmute everyone? Please just wait one second, everyone. We're just figuring out how we can best do this. In the meantime. Let's start with some um, questions in the chat. What is an ideal length of program activities? I.e., we were planning to organize a program over the course of a year, one event per month. Is that too long? Well, I mean, all activities should be should last within one month. Uh, sorry, within be be for the next year after you've applied. So it is possible to do to do that. Uh, we expect that the funding, because it's you know it's, it's limited to three and a half thousand. If you can make it over, last over twelve events, then um, bravo. But we would expect that you know the 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 amount of events would probably be be less than that. Um, it's obviously up to you and what you were planning. And if the funding works, then great. But uh, yeah, we'd expect most events to sort of uh, be around uh, you know anything from from two upwards. Uh, most likely into single figures um but if you can make 12 work then great have we fixed that or andrew do you want to just try again are you, you you're on mute now if you unmute can can we hear you Yeah, I think we're struggling with that. We'll try and fix it. But if anybody could put questions in the chat, we'll try and go through those as best as we can. And we'll figure out technically what's going on there. Because I can see, I can see you're not on mute. Um, okay, Demi says, am I eligible if I have team members both in and outside of England? What's the definition of based in England? Well, if you yourself are the applicant uh, and you are funding activities that happen in England, uh, then then that should be fine. Um, you know, I think there is some definition of, uh, you know, what is an independent promoter? And if it's somebody who works in a team of more than three people, it's probably not deemed as independent. But if you are applying as a solo applicant and you are based in England, funding activities in England, then I don't see a reason that you wouldn't be um, eligible uh, Adam says, I'm interested in making two separate applications for this fund. One as part of my own independent live music series and another as an independent community radio station that I help run and have promoted a few events for already. Would this be possible? If they're both in your name and the fund is going to the same place, then no, we would only be able to fund 
uh, one application per person for this entire fund. So they couldn't both be um, successful. Um, so please uh, pick which one you want to apply for in that instance. Heather says, will any toolkits and masterclasses be available to young promoters who are not grantees? Good question. We are hoping that is going to be the case. We are putting them together uh, shortly. And the idea is that if we can create a good enough pool of resources that would help the sector to develop, then that is what we'll do. And we'll um, we'll open that out to, um, to everybody. So just keep following our socials and the progress on this. And um, we'll get to that as soon as we can. If you're unsuccessful in round one due to competition, can you just reapply the next round with the same application? We will try and advise you when we when we give a rejection, if we do, uh, whether we think your application is strong but missed out due to competitiveness. Um, it's very likely that you would want to improve it to some degree, if, especially if you have the time to do so. I would just wait and see what notes you get back with a rejection uh, and, and take it from there. I think that's probably um, the best thing to do rather than just putting it in again, um, you know, because you, um, you know, we recommend, as I say, you, you put there, can you do the next round? We recommend waiting three months unless it is really desperate in terms of time frame um, and everything else. Uh, how should we label multi-genre events? Is that something you wouldn't recommend given how the applications are assessed? I think if it's, if it's a multi-genre event, I think that's uh, I think that's fine. I think that's an interesting idea. Um, all applications are assessed by at least two um, people anyway, so we would just try and make sure that we were covering um, all the bases to make sure you had a fair. Uh, hearing on that so yeah that's absolutely fine ken says i have several ideas for events of different types can i submit various applications and go with whichever is accepted if any uh this isn't a recommendation uh it's you know because you're only going to get one crack at this as an individual so please just put forward your your best idea i think if it's unsuccessful it might be that the next idea is is the one uh, it might be a sort of case of trial and error, but we don't. Obviously, we're going to be getting a lot of applications and, um, you know, our advisors are going to be extremely busy. Um, if application would be ineligible if they come in uh, with multiple net, with the same name multiple times. So I, I, it's definitely not advised. If I've only hosted two events to date, would it be better for me to wait until I have uh I've held the third or am I still eligible? You're still eligible. Nobody is ineligible as such. You are not going to be not able to, to give the support. I think the advice we're giving is that we expect to be able to be giving the support to those who've who've promoted, uh, you know, a small number of events, whereas we think it's highly unlikely we'll fund people who've, who are classed as experienced promoters. This is open intentionally because, you know, this is a new fund and we want to help those people that are uh, most at need and most at that, that stage where they're ready to, to um, take, take a step up with their promoter careers. Until we see the applications and, and, and what's coming in, you know, we are leaving it as open as possible, but giving our, our recommendations on where we expect um, the line to be drawn in terms of what what needs funding and what doesn't. So we don't tell you not to put it in, um, but um, you know uh, if you've only hosted two events, you may be on the lower end, but you're certainly not ineligible. We wouldn't we wouldn't use that word. Uh, Charlotte says, "Is one event too little? Uh, say one event with a big lineup rather than a few with a couple of artists." We would expect to be funding events and give priority to uh, multiple events, but it doesn't mean that you couldn't be funded for one event. Um, you know, the important thing is as well to make sure that you are thinking about yourself and your capacity building and network development. So that there's, there's stuff in there that, that helps with, uh, with that as well uh, and not just funding um, one event. 
can we apply it as a collective of people? <clears throat> I think this comes back to a question I answered earlier about, you know, this is for independent promoters. Uh, we expect independent to really mean you are working solo or in a collaboration of two people. Uh, if you are a collective of three, four, five, then it, it gets to the stage where you may not be viewed um, as independent. I think, you know, again, you've got a chance on the application form to say that you feel that you partly fit the eligibility. If you feel there is another reason why uh, you still should be funded and have the opportunity to um uh and have the opportunity to uh develop your career then please you know answer partly and tell us why and we'll we will consider the application uh I had a direct one here that said the grant won't cover purchase of portable PA for venues without equipment the the, the grant is not for AV equipment that will long live in venues or for yourself it is for specifically for events <clears throat> uh, ken says on your example application i did not spot what you included for your own fee did i miss that uh no you didn't miss that so the application example i gave um i guess was based on on uh uh flat fee example for the promoter I, for the artist i probably could and should have included a fee for myself in there um you know obviously there are many different deal types and if you're doing an 80 20 split or what, whatever split you want to do with your artist then uh, you may be um you know only planning to take from um you know any profits as we discussed at the beginning how you would distribute your profits i could have put my own fee in there and we do encourage you to think about that um if if you if you wish to do that obviously there's also the opportunity to put in some funds as well that will help develop your career which is the most important thing here but obviously we respect everybody's time and um we um support people who do put um fees in for themselves uh i'm applying as a cic will that not be eligible lk asks i think that is uh a question we might want to answer out of session i'm not entirely sure on that uh, i will give you the email address shortly and maybe that's when we can pick up on email um you're asking if that would still count as independent um i suspect not but i think let's drop us an email and we'll we'll talk that through so it's applications at prsfoundation.com i will be displaying that um soon okay uh charles asks is it better to work and develop a relationship with one venue or to spread work across different venues would either be seen as more preferable well if you're already promoting at one venue and this fund is to help you you know make that step forward I would say that, you know, working across different venues is a good way of you expanding your network and trying new things and working on a bigger scale. So I think we would give more weighting to somebody who was planning to work across um, various venues. And Adam asks, if we're putting in information about how we would pay ourselves, how should this be calculated? For example, an hourly rate for time put into the preparation and running of the event. Yeah, you could do that. I'd refer back again to the Arts Council England's um, uh fair pay guide i would definitely um refer you to that in terms of paying artists you know you will find fair rates on mu and other other trade bodies so um think about that but definitely in terms of paying yourself um uh, read the arts council's fair pay guide you could give yourself an hourly rate um for the work you expect to do on the project um you know we expect people to to pay themselves fairly so um yeah there's there's no set amount i would say is recommended um but just pay yourself for what you believe is the industry standard in uh, in in the field that you're working in and matthias asked can i apply to the other right fund for a project to take place this year and then apply to the arts council grassroots fund for a bigger pro bigger to take place next year but to apply for both this year um yeah, I don't I think if you do it in that order, I don't believe that there would be anything with the ACE application that would make you ineligible for that if you come through our fund. I, I can't speak um for their fund. Um, you know, it might be uh, quite 
um, quite a jump up from um, applying for this fund this year um, to then, uh, you know, the the the, the ACE um, supporting grassroots music fund is for um, established um, promoters. So it may be that um, that you know that is uh, quite a big step to take in the space of a year. But I, re I can't really speak for the ACE um, criterion on that. Um, but definitely worth looking into with them. Um, Mina asks, what about minimum bar spend models? Should that be included as the budget as a cost of amount isn't met? If that's the way you're working, you know, we're aware that obviously there are many deal types and we'll go around this in the wraparound support and masterclasses for those that aren't aware of the different deal types that are around. Um, yeah, if, if a minimum bar spend model is is how you're working, then please just explain that in the guidance. Um, you know, there's nothing that makes that ineligible as such. Um, so, yeah, we've got to the end of the questions and it's exactly six o'clock. If anyone has anything else, then please type quickly. Otherwise, we'll round up. Very sorry for the technical problems with the sound. I'm not quite sure why. We weren't able to hear people today, but certainly we are running a further session. Um, just share my screen again briefly. Uh, one second. Okay, we are. Running further sessions, uh, we'll try and make sure we can hear you in. Um, so uh, on the 30th, as I say, we're going to have in conversation with guest promoter Anna Molson of Melting Vinyl. So we're going to talk more about the importance of skill building and network connections and what support should include in your applications for your early career promoter fund. Uh, there'll be the chance for some more, more questions there. We do encourage you to join, but this session is going to be recorded and available online for anyone who can't make it. And then three days before the deadline, June the 10th, we're going to have a, ask us anything, a whole hour of Q&A for those who are drafting or those who are still considering a late application. And that'll be with me to answer any last minute questions applicants may have ahead of deadline one. And you can find our email address there at the bottom. If you do have any specific questions, um, please email applications at prsfoundation.com. Uh, com um if you have emailed recently on that email address um do apologize for any slight delay we will get back to you as soon as possible on that so that is the end of the session today there's no more questions come in i hope that was helpful do ask us more questions if they come up i'm sure they will but i hope that kind of gives you a, a sense of what the application is the the fund is there for and you know a signpost to how you can find more information and i really hope you can join us at the other sessions and um yeah we can help to guide you some more thank you everyone <laughs>